and my presentation is called what is trauma-informed counseling and what is the science behind it and kind of before I totally begin that um, one of the things I was uh, thinking about was it is um, September 11th and so uh, a very good illustration a terrible illustration but also a useful illustration of trauma is if you remember where you were on September 11th, 2001, when you heard about the terrible tragedy that went on in New York and elsewhere. Um, and if you think about that, just for a moment, that's an example of a shared collective trauma. So that's a shared collective trauma that uh, everyone has who was affiliated with our country, but also uh, countries across the world were very upset by this and people from around the world uh, collectively were uh, very traumatized in, in a sort of a vicarious way. So for instance, some people may actually have known people that died. Um, I know people that know people that died in the attacks. Um, my friend was next door working at another building and she got covered with ash. She had to run. She uh, was able to actually get back to her apartment, which was five miles away, and she walked the whole way like a zombie. And she remembers not much from the day, but just sort of being shocked. And uh, it changed her life, and that's actually why she got into uh, trauma counseling. And now she's a therapist in Seattle. Um, so that is an example of how the brain will bring um, neurons together and remember sights, sounds, tastes, and things very vividly. So for all, for some of us um, therapists, we haven't had a major trauma happen to us, maybe, that we would consider something that we could get PTSD from or something like that. But if you remember 9-11, that's a good example of, like I remember seriously eating like cereal and my friend in the cafeteria at college looking like a zombie and going, they bombed the Twin Towers, which wasn't true, it was actually airplanes, but he didn't even, he was so confused that that was his explanation to me. So essentially uh, what that moment of like looking at the cereal and the toast is like burned in my memory, right? And then what else is burned in my memory is going out and watching the TV with all the other students at Michigan State because we didn't have cool phones in 2001 like this. We had TV monitors, you know? So I remember that so vividly. So if you think about any client that comes in with a, some type of trauma history, even if it's not PTSD, which I'll we'll get into why, they their their trauma memory unless they've dissociated which is a whole nother topic is burned in their memory just like 9 11 is for us but multiply that by about 100 because it actually happened to them physically or mentally at the time uh, and so perception of course is more important than what actually happened to you so if you if you're perceiving if your brain perceives that you had a trauma you that is a trauma so little disclaimer about my presentation all of the other presentations have cool demonstrations, fun videos, and application for your clients. Because I was going first and I felt like I really need to lay down the paradigm of what trauma-informed counseling is, this is a straight lecture. So I'm sorry, but I did this on purpose by going first because I knew you'd have caffeine, hopefully, or some type of other stimulant in your system. Maybe just waking up and smelling the roses and going for a walk in your neighborhood and bluebirds on your shoulder and all that made you wake up and you're going to have to listen to this. Because if you get this paradigm, everything else you're hearing today will be so easy for you to apply to your clients. So that's why this paradigm was difficult for me to first grasp when I first got this information about 10, 11 years ago when I was working in Arizona because I was not taught this in grad school at all. And I went to grad school 15 years ago. We, we got a class on post-traumatic stress disorder, but that was what I knew to be trauma. That's all I knew. So. My name is Paul Kraus. I'm the clinical director, and I've been a therapist for 13 years. Um, and I host a podcast that you can listen to if you want uh, called The Intentional Clinician, where I interview other therapists, but also a bunch of nerdy philosophers. Um, we are working to make a trauma-informed counseling center here in Grand Rapids, and we're pretty close to having it filled out, meaning that all of our clinicians have trauma-specific trainings and are certified in something. Um, about 90% there, so we're calling ourselves that already. I'm working on some other projects. You can ask me about if you want to email me. That's me, okay. 
there's the objectives, but that is for the social work board. I'm just hoping that you uh, learn some of these things. They were in your, they're in the notes that were emailed to you. So let's just go further. So what is trauma? There's lots of definitions of this, okay? And I actually think trauma is the beginning of the evolution of, uh, of a new type of discussion, okay? And what I'm gonna present today is honestly like a miniature apple slice. Like I'm talking like a real small apple slice of what the science on trauma is. And the science on trauma has been exponential since about 2000. It started in the 90s, but since the 2000s, there's amazing stuff. So if you're looking for more, the interpersonal neurobiology is a good place to start by Dan Siegel out of USC, uh, or UCLA, excuse me. And uh, there's so many other researchers that are doing a better job. And so what, we, what we're, we're calling it trauma because of a lack of language. We don't, we don't know what to call it totally yet, but I like to call it like an um, autonomic nervous system issue or dysautonomia, which is a medical issue, but that's more advanced. So let's just start with trauma. And I don't need to give you the full definition here, but if you like taking notes, this is from SAMHSA. Um, and basically it's an event or series of events or circumstances that are experienced by an individual physically, emotionally, life-threatening that have adverse effects on the individual's functioning, right? So obviously mental, physical, social, spiritual. Um, so a lot of people have specific traumas that they come in for, like I was assaulted, right? Or I was in a car accident or, um, you know, something happened. But a lot of, a lot of people that um, present with a lot of uh, DSM disorders, um, started out with chronic childhood trauma. And I'll get into what, what that is in a minute. So this is where I like to start because this is kind of where the research started from is the adverse child experiences study, um, which was conducted in the early 90s. 90s. And uh, basically that's why when we talk about trauma, it's again, it's inadequate language, but we're not just talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. We're talking about the way information or physical things, or social things, or perceptions of things cause a nervous system disturbance. So that's not in your slides. It's a nervous system disturbance, and then that is memorized by your brain and remapped. That starts to essentially reorient uh, you to the world in many bad ways, which I'll get into. Um, your narrative can change. That can lead to depression, anxiety, all the things in the DSM. Uh, your ability to calm yourself can go away. That can lead to substance use. Um, your ability to self-regulate can go away. That can lead to all sorts of weird personality disorders that are very stressful for us clinicians, right? Um, it can lead to uh, destructive relationships because you're trying to get your needs met or you're trying to re-experience, you're accidentally re-experiencing uh, the trauma, which I'll get into. So let, we'll get into that. So that was my little definition. Um, this is in 1995, they did this study at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, 17,000 people. Um, basically, they were given questionnaires, which actually I forgot I am gonna have you do the questionnaire, uh, about people having bad child experiences, adverse child experiences, um, neglect, abuse, family dysfunction, physical, emotional neglect, sexual abuse, all, anything like that, uh, somebody using drugs in the household, somebody going to prison, so some pretty, some pretty traumatic things there. Uh, on this study, and then they track their health outcomes. So essentially, what they found was, it is if you had one of these adverse child experiences, your cor the correlation was you are much more likely to have mental and physical health problems and addictions. If you had two, if you had three, if you had four, if you had five, it just went, it, it was correlated. Now, is everyone who has these adverse child experiences have these? Absolutely not. No, we're talking about statistics, big numbers, 17,000 participants, and they've done a lot more studies since here, which prove the same correlation. There are definitely people that don't have lifelong physical and mental health issues from trauma. So we have to remember that there's a resilient factor with some people where they, they, try, they almost go the opposite way, right? Um, but that's not everybody. So in general, the general population, this is true. Um, essentially, you're going to have more severe issues without throughout the lifespan, including physical. The big one for me that I thought was the takeaway from the science is it's the physical stuff, um, which we'll get into, uh, like heart disease, hypertension, all sorts of things like that, possible addiction, et cetera. So um, this 
this uh, study was actually quite controversial in the 90s when it came out. Um, a lot of people were dismissive of it. Uh, and essentially, people could not believe that one in uh, five people had endured three or more. And approximately two thirds of the 17,000 people in San Diego had had, had at least one. So uh, that kind of was messing with people's narratives of what the nuclear family is supposed to be. And the other thing was that uh, basically, you know, this was just an initial study that kind of woke up the scientific community to, hey, we need to start studying this. Uh, my slides are, of course, very wordy because that's what I like to do. You can email me for these slides if you want them. Uh, essentially, they, they, they started trying to make new modalities of treatment because we're not just dealing with talking anymore. Um, the, the people that have, you know, trauma in their past, it's very difficult for them to benefit from straight talk therapy. It takes a lot longer. They do benefit from it. The, uh, the statistics of therapy being effective in its talk form in basic Carl Rogers and CBT form is amazing, right? Uh, we know that, that doesn't change this. But when we, when we started working with tra traumatized individuals or people that have um, trauma in their background, the, the, the talk therapy isn't as effective as what we've, we've seen. And so we had to come up with some new methods to integrate talk therapy with other things, which we're gonna talk about throughout the, uh, throughout the um, presentation. So if you're following along at home or here, um, and you want to, this is optional, you can actually do your own ACE quiz right now, which I'm going to go through. Um, and you can just keep your results to yourself and write uh, yes or no. Like, so you enter the number one if this happened to you. So number one, while you're growing up during your first 18 years, did you did a parent or another adult in your household swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid to, that you might be physically hurt? If yes, write down a one on your paper. Number two, did a parent or other adult in the household push, grab, slap, or throw something at you or hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Again, this is the original A study. We've now expanded it, but we'll just go with it. If yes, enter one. Did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch you, fondle you, or have touch your body in a sexual way or try to have oral, anal, or vaginal sex with you, yes or no? If yes, hit one. So you're adding this up. So there's three questions. If you entered yes, you'd have three marks. If you enter no, you have no marks. Um, did you feel that? This is a perception. Did you often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other or support each other? If yes, enter one. Did you often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes and had no one to protect you or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you? or take you to the doctor if needed? If yes, mark a one. Uh, were your parents ever separated or divorced? If yes, enter one. Oh yes, I, we did not send you the slides, I'm just letting you know, but if you want them, you can email me, which Shannon will give the email at the end and I'm very findable on the internet. So uh, I didn't send the slides for a reason because people usually just read the slides and don't listen. So. Again, here's three more questions on the screen. If you enter it, just mark a one next on your paper if that happened. Was your mother a stepmother often? So this is, of course, a little bit culturally dated. This is from the 90s. Uh, often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or something hard, uh, even repeatedly hit over a few minutes or threatened with a gun or knife you can kind of extrapolate that. It doesn't have to be just your mother or stepmother. Uh, if yes, hit one. Did you or anyone, uh, did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker, alcoholic, or who used street drugs? Yes, hit one. Was a member depressed or mentally ill, or did a household member attempt suicide? If yes, hit one. Did a household member go to prison or jail? If yes, hit one. Now, if you add up all your yes answers, that is your ACE score, uh, your average child experiences score. And you can see, if you go to some of the ACE study websites, what that correlates with. So the higher the ACE score, the more predictive and correlated um, m problems that you perceive or maybe don't perceive are there. So even, even one of them was just increased risk of smoking and becoming um, 
you know, addicted to certain substances. And that even includes food, um, not just uh, alcohol and drugs. So <clears throat> a whopping two thirds of the 17,000 uh, people studied right here had like one. And then these are like, these are uh, essentially percentages. So these are percentages of the people studied uh, and women four or more, 15 percent of the of the uh, 17,000 men nine percent and then the total if you correlate everything was the average was 12.5 percent and having zero that was only 36 percent of the people studied um, and you can see that these were a lot more uh, prevalent than we would consider now here's why uh, essentially the some of the correlations they found were also heart disease, lung cancer, diabetes, and autoimmune diseases, and then of course depression, and then here's this becoming violence, uh, uh, acting violently, so acting out. Um, so like, for instance, if you go to the prison population and give them the ACE quiz, you will find, and I, I I don't have the study in front of me, but they've done a little bit of this. You will find a very high ACE score among almost all prisoners. We're talking like four, five, six. Um, being a victim of violence, um, another one, domestic uh, women and men who have been victims of domestic violence usually have a high ACE score, almost always. Anyone with, uh, not all people with suicide, but a lot of people with suicide have a high ACE score. Um, there are 70 other publications, so you can check it out. Childhood was trauma. Now, here, here's the thing here. You know, there's a stereotype of like, when I say prisoners or whatever. So the people in the Kaiser Permanente study were mostly white middle-class college educated people because Kaiser Permanente is a fantastic insurance company in California and some of the best benefits you can get. It's kind of like Blue Cross with more benefits in Michigan and it's, it's really expensive. So the people that were in this study were mostly uh, Caucasian uh, college educated middle-class people in uh, San Diego. Um, we see that there's a direct link between childhood trauma and chronic disease as well. And um, we kind of, I've basically already said this. Basically, uh, most people in the study experience more than one type of trauma. It's usually, it's rarely only sexual abuse or verbal abuse. So if you had sexual abuse or verbal abuse happen to you, you probably had something else go on in childhood. Um, that's what we're seeing. Let's see here. Yeah, so the higher the A score, the more likely you are to have health or social issues. I already said that. Um, so this study was only focused on childhood, which is under 18. So if we understand certain people had these things happen in childhood, right? But then they get in dysfunctional relationships or they're in a difficult job environment. They don't know how to stick up for themselves. They don't have those skills. Trauma can become amplified. It's not like whatever happened to you in childhood determines your entire life. Like that's kind of an old theory, attachment theory, uh, trauma theory, um, any sort of mental health theory is always what's going on now. Now, if, you're in, if it happened to you in childhood, for sure, while your brain was developing, you're at way higher risk and um, much more difficulties, more, most likely. But it doesn't mean that if you had like this idyllic childhood where you weren't abused, and then all of a sudden you go off to college and really bad things happen to you, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden you can't you know, you know, have a lot of chronic health issues and things come out of that. However, you, you do possibly have a better chance at becoming resilient because you had that incubated childhood where your brain was able to function with healthy attachment and not being abused. Even if your parents weren't ideal, you weren't being abused, that's gonna help your brain recover. So for instance, I've worked with two different clients. Both were raped their freshman year of college. One had a fantastic childhood. Her parents are super supportive. She told her parents about it. She got tons of therapy. She did EMDR therapy. She did talk therapy and she's doing fantastic now. She is married. She's got kids and she has, and she's reported no sexual uh, side effects. Almost no. I mean, like not like zero, but pretty much no compared to your average rape victim. I've worked with another person who uh, was raped her freshman year of college. She's much older now. She's probably in her sixties and her parent, her childhood was terrible. Her father was an alcoholic. He left the family. Her brother beat her up. Her mother was also an alcoholic, didn't leave the family, but she basically was parentified. She never felt safe in her entire life. She finally met the guy of her dreams when she was at uh, university. He raped her when she was 18. And since then, she has had 
autoimmune disorders, thyroid disorders, cancer, um, weight gain, um, then followed by um, what's that called? Anorexia. She's had uh, chronic depression, chronic anxiety, and um, obviously when I diagnosed her, it's PTSD because frequently she'll continue to have flashbacks of this person that raped her, even, even with EMDR treatment. And her words to me recently were, I spent most of my life not getting proper treatment. And then I, you know, I met you, but she, she, she's literally said to me, I think it's too late for me. I've had 45 years of not getting treatment post-rape and I had 18 years of abuse. So my entire life has been mostly abuse. And so not to be dismal, but this is what things can do to us, right? And this is where mental health diagnoses can manifest from. And so they don't just happen now. There are, there are biological factors. I'm not discounting the biological factors of depression or bipolar that you can inherit, right? You can, but it's called epigenetics, which is still being studied. Epigenetics is, is something happens in your environment and it triggers a genetic thing that you were passed down and then right there is probably going to be your chronic depression, right? But trauma is something that can create it, even if you don't have a biological epigenetic propensity towards depression or alcoholism or whatever it might be. So, um, so here's just a couple of things. As your ACE score increases of four or more, the likelihood of chronic pulmonary lung disease increases 390%, hepatitis 240%, depression 460%, and attempted suicide, 1,220%. So if you have an A score of four or higher, that's the statistics on that one. Um, again, oh, that's right, I already said that. But essentially, this was, these were middle class people that were studying the initial one. So if you're from you know, the biopic community, uh, statistically speaking, in the US, you can look this up, less, less likely to have adequate healthcare education or even healthy food markets. They call food deserts, right? In some urban parts of the city. They're, I'm not saying that they automatically are gonna have a higher ACE score, but there's more factors involved that can lead to family stress, which can lead to uh, issues there. Um, so the other thing here, and this is from Dr. Bruce Perry. He's a medical doctor and a PhD, and then his uh, associates. And uh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, there we are. So parallel research was done at the same time of the ACE study on toxic chronic stress uh, and how that damages a child's developing brain. And so chronic toxic stress is not even in the DSM, okay? <laughs> But stress is one of the only things we can physically measure. In a doctor's office, if you're stressed, you will have a certain pulse rate. You will have a, a hypertensive uh, physiology. Um, you will either be gaining weight or losing weight. You will have uh, insomnia or hypersomnia. You will, um, I'm trying to think of other hard, hard health outcomes. You, uh, you, you will have all sorts of issues if you're chronically stressed, right? And stress is one of the things that can trigger the epigenetic development of a mental health disorder. The stress hits the epigenetics just right. You have a propensity for anxiety. Now you've got generalized anxiety disorder. That's how it shows up, right? This is the roots of what we're talking about. We're not talking about the grass that we see. You know, a psychiatrist who's really smart can diagnose people pretty quick. But what, what started that root? Because we're the therapist. We want to see what's going on in the roots. We're not just looking at the grass, okay? We're not just trying to whack the symptoms with a mallet. We're trying to figure out how do we pull out the root system or heal the root system. The psychiatrist's job is to keep people not to not kill themselves or others. Therefore, they give them the drug. That should calm them down for the time being. Um, so a lot of research on this. You can check it out at Child Trauma Academy. But they were essentially determining that when children are overloaded, overloaded with stress hormones, so stress hormones in children, they, they go into almost a continuous fight, flight, or freeze mode, and they have difficult learning, difficult time learning in school. And in fact, there's even a research study on this, and you can check this out at that website, um, Child Trauma Academy or developingchild.harvard, that when parents raise their voice and yell at children chronically, that literally, physiologically, and this is in brain scan, this just is in the last three years, that their, their, their ability to hear in the brocus area of the brain actually begins to shut down. And I don't mean hear as in like audio. I'm talking about 
their ability to process the audio. It literally is shutting down and their hippocampus and amygdala area is rejecting the, impl uh, the information into short-term memory, right? So I was a teacher once, um, but I didn't love it. But one thing I learned from classroom management is try to talk in the same volume of voice the whole time and don't raise your voice to the children because then they'll just rebel against you. Well, I didn't know why. I just figured that was some old teacher came up with that. Well, now the research is uh, proving that when you yell at people, they will most likely go into fight, flight, freeze, especially children. Now, if you've been through the military, I have relatives in the Marines. If you yell at them, they don't care because they went through extensive training to be okay being yelled at in basic training, right? And they can tolerate that and they will respond to you just like you responded to them. They've been trained, right? But, but children, they're not trained. We're training the children all the time, right? We're training people. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of issues with children in school is that um, anxiety, depression, guilt, shame, inability to focus, and then they might turn to drugs and have high-risk behaviors comes exactly from not feeling safe, being in a fight, flight, freeze situation. So chronic toxic stress, if a child has domestic violence in their home, any of the ACE issues going on at home, it's gonna automatically make them have difficulties learning. So if you've ever been involved in an IEP or a 504 plan as a teacher, you'll know that we always find this, we always bring in the social workers and the therapists. Why? Because there's always something going on at home. It's not that this child can't learn, usually, there are children with brain defects, there are children with Down syndrome, there are children with autism that literally just have a brain defect and have difficulty learning and behavior. However, the ch a lot of these children have unhealthy brains due to the chronic toxic stress going on at home. And that is where we come in. Michigan, I found this out, you can look this up. Michigan has the lowest ratio of school counselors and social workers to students of any state in the United States. We are number 50. We lost to Mississippi and Alaska. I don't know how that's possible, but it's true. And that statistic came out last year when I was trying to deal with the state legislature. And I found that out and I was like, okay, so we got a lot of work to do here in Michigan to get counselors and social workers into schools, right? We need that. Forest Hill School, I hear somebody on Zoom coughing. Um, Forest Hill Schools has a fantastic social work program, but Forest Hill Schools, if you're from around here, is the most, one of the most wonderful and most resourced school districts in the state. Gretchen Whitmer is an alumni of Forest Hills North or Central, whatever, one of them. There's three of them. Um, real good school district, amazing social workers getting paid like 55K. And they're doing mindful schools in the schools and those kids are doing all right. So notice that, you know, that's something to notice about what's going on with the children who aren't doing well who may be going to some like rural school in the near Jackson, who, you know, are now getting the cops called on them in middle school. You know, that's just a, that's just a, 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 med, a, a, unfortunately a predictor of what is to come if they don't get the kind of help they need. And unfortunately they're probably not getting the help at home. So how do we balance that as a community? That's another presentation. I don't know. So um, this is another thing using drugs and risky behaviors are another result of ACE we've seen with the correlation. Um, because, and then of course, um, obesity and diabetes is another way to calm the body by eating. Overeating is a way to calm your nervous system. Um, you can go from your sympathetic nervous system, I'm really freaking out, to parasympathetic, relax. My friends are um, medics. Uh, I have a friend who's an EMT in Phoenix. And you know, one of the first things they do when they find somebody who's ranting and raving and screaming on the street, they give them a bottle of water and crackers. And as soon as that person eats the crackers and drinks a little water, they almost always calm down. Almost always, unless they're completely psychotic. Why is that? Their nervous system is on overdrive. Maybe they're homeless. Maybe something's going on with them. You eat the crackers, drink the water. They'll be compliant with EMTs and the police. But if you don't give them the water and the crackers, and they've tried this, this is my friend's, of course, own research, they will just keep screaming at you and resist any attempts to help. So there's more research going on that we believe toxic chronic stress can be uh, passed down from generation to generation. A lot of that research is coming from some of the Holocaust studies. So they call it transgenerational trauma, that the children of Holocaust victims that survived had all sorts of weird problems. So, you know, this is something that's being passed down in our DNA. And that's crazy, but it's happening. I mean, it's crazy to me. I didn't hear this in grad school. 
Um, essentially, you can pass on stuff to your children, which is wild. So here is a really cool illustration. So the whole lifespan from conception to death is on the bottom. And the adverse child conspiracy of experiences is here. Now here's the issue. If you see here, it says scientific gaps. Okay. We don't, we, we can't fully, we see a correlation, right? But we can't fully prove causation. It's just still in its infancy because we're talking about a complex set of behaviors. We're talking about a complex health conditions. We're talking about not only physical health conditions, but mental health conditions. And then of course, certain people become more resilient in some ways and become very highly, uh, uh, what do you call it? People we look up to in our culture, right? Heroes in our culture who went through terrible adverse child experiences. It's just that they're the exception, not the norm. The norm is impairments, adoption of high-risk behaviors or other issues. Uh, those are the two gaps. We know for sure disease, disability, and social problems are, are, are there, right? We know that, but we don't exactly, we can't 100% prove why we just see it in the statistics. Um, the good news, I have good news, sorry. Good news is coming. Um, our brains and lives are very plastic. Um, resilience studies show that if you have an integration of resilience factors, such as being able to ask for help, developing trusting friendships, forming a positive attitude, listening to feelings, it, this can help people improve their lives over time, right? Not just right away, but over time. And that happens not just in therapy, but in the community. Uh, neurons that wire together, fire together. So if you want to know more what I'm talking about, again, Dan Siegel's work and the Norton book series on interpersonal neurobiology. And there's about 20 books now, all from research that is now applied to psychology. And some of those books even apply it to therapy, but it's still in its infancy, right? We're still, we're in the last 20 years is when this has come about. Therefore, that we are, our therapeutic, uh, you know, work and our, our grad schools have not caught up to this. I did talk to somebody recently who did hear this in grad school, but they are much younger than me. So um, it, apparently it's starting to get there. Uh, essentially, if, if uh, the neurons are wiring together and they fire together and you have this positive, insulated environment for the child or the person, even post-childhood, and we work or working on holistically, um, we can then work on decreasing long-term negative outcomes from the traumatic experience. So there is hope, but it's not just therapy. It's a wraparound approach. Now, therapy sometimes is the only lifeline. So, you know, that's, that's the, <coughs> the person's only hope is to get into therapy because they don't have healthy people in their life. They don't have healthy people at their job that they feel that they can talk with. They don't have a good school to go to and they don't really have a good neighborhood to go home to. So this is again um, from Dan Siegel and Dr. Bruce Perry, et cetera. Um, let's see, <clears throat> I'm gonna skip a little bit, but essentially one of the biggest concepts that we need to learn here is that, um, you know, back when we were younger in science class, I'm like almost 40, but they kind of talked about the brain and the nervous system and the lungs and the organs and the heart as all separate entities. And they are in some sense, right? But they're all very interconnected, right? If you don't, if you don't have the interconnection, you will die basically. So um, when you have people that have a mental health symptom and physical symptoms, this is going on throughout the body. It's a two way street. So your nervous system goes all the way through every single organ in your body and all your fingertips. That's how I'm moving my hands right now is because I have a nervous system. So if something happens to my hand and somebody decides they want to try to chop off my hand and they hold my hand against a saw, I'm never going to forget that. I hope that doesn't happen to me, but I'm, I'm probably never going to forget that. And if they start sawing away at my hand, I'm going to be feeling that. That's pretty gross, right? But I've got your attention. So essentially that nervous system is going all the way up into my brain and, and putting some information there that I would rather not have. Okay. Not only that, but I felt physical pain here, right? And so basically what happens is it's a two-way street. That's why people feel physically weird when they're depressed. They feel heavy and, you know, like this. They feel downtrodden. They, they, and, and when people are anxious, some people report they have stomach pain, right? Some people report my chest is tight, right? My neck, my, my neck is tight. Um, when people have post-traumatic stress disorder, I've heard people saying when I have a flashback, my whole body's on fire. 
my body's on fire. That's because our nervous system is connected to our brain. Our brain is so powerful. If you don't believe how uh, powerful our brain is, look up the placebo studies in Harvard that there's a whole school of placebo studies, including fake knee surgeries they did on old folks, not kidding, and the people that had the fake knee surgery did better than the people that had the real knee, knee surgery because people that had fake knee surgery had less recovery time and were, went to the physical therapy, same as the people that had the real knee surgery. And it's crazy. Check out that study. That's not what my presentation is about. But placebo is a very, very amazing thing if we, we don't know how to harness it. Whoever, somebody said that, uh, in the placebo studies, whoever can figure out how to make placebo um, activate for everybody will obliterate the entire pharmaceutical and supplement and herb industry in the United States. Because you literally will not need anything if a placebo pill, if you took this pill and said, oh, your foot's going to stop hurting so much now because it's not a structural problem, it's a physical pain issue. Oh, your foot stopped hurting. Good. Okay. Placebo wins. You know, because your brain can do that. Now, your brain can't fix a broken foot. That's not what I'm talking about. But if you have random phantom pain in your foot, and placebo, you'll see it from the placebo studies. Your brain can really rewire around that. Um, I talked about epigenetics. I talked about this already. Um, so here's an issue. Um, when people have trauma happen to them in the brain or in their body or whatever, they start to internalize the concept and they start to make really bad narratives, which is what we all see when we have clients come in our door. These, like, re these really bad narratives a worthlessness, I'm never safe, I can't trust people, I'm not in control, life sucks, I'm a failure, no matter what, I'm unworthy, all these bad narratives. Um, I, can't, I can't go make friends because everybody's an asshole and they're out for themselves. All of these things come from their experiences, but the problem is, if you've had a trauma, is it starts getting wired so that it's, it's a total truth. So you've heard of, of course, the, um, uh, what's that called, core belief? Well, the core beliefs are being wired in by some traumatic experience because that traumatic experience overwhelmed the body and the nervous system and it stuck. Just like when I said, remember where you were on 9-11, right now everyone remember it again. You remember it. You remember where you were. You remember what you were eating or not eating. You remember what watching the radio or the TV or listening to the radio. Um, you know, at that moment, their trauma is wired in and over and over assaults them. 9-11 is no longer assaulting my brain because I wasn't there. My friends were there. I feel worse for them. It didn't directly happen to me. It was vicariously happened to me. And I'm upset about it still, but it's not assaulting me in my dreams. It's not assaulting me in my daily life. But sometimes when I see an American flag, this is true, I'll think, oh, 9-11. Why? Because there's that picture of the firefighters with the American flag. And I always thought, oh my gosh, that's so crazy, right? It's kind of like... Um, an iconic image, right? It's in my mind. So sometimes when I see an American flag on 4th of July, I think 9-11, not 4th of July, unfortunately. But so there's, there's something wired in my brain. Um, and then that can go to a negative narrative. So here's, here's some of the things I'm gonna jump through. Um, negative, so when we meet a client, we have a list of symptoms, behaviors, information, negative stories, presenting problems. A lot of this stuff has been wired. This is the surface. The surface is what we see. What's going on? Um, underneath is we work on forming an opinion of what's going on based on our training, our preferences, cultural biases. So essentially, um, this might be too much to present today. Uh, we need to understand that while a diagnosis is a clinical formulation analysis are necessary to make measurable treatment goals required by insurance companies, our opinion about why this person is the way they is, is usually useless. It's useless. What's happening with them is important. What they tell us is important is important. What the diagnosis is is pretty important only because it informs us on what the behaviors and the symptoms are. But our opinion is useless because we don't know why it originated yet. That takes a while in therapy to figure out and that takes a while to root out. And that comes from the uh, research of Scott Miller and PhD and some other people on the common factors. We have to work on getting out of the habit of making opinions about clients. Um, it's something that we all do kind of in the back of our mind anyway. We, we always have judgments and opinions in our minds and they're always gonna be there. So I'm not saying you can just like all of a sudden be like totally neutral and like, I don't have any opinions or biases against my clients that none of them bother me. That's called counter transference, right? We have that. 
but we have to really work on examining our own story and understand how the trauma research fits in to why this person ended up in your office, okay? Um, because the narrative and the symptoms and the behaviors are only the surface of what's really going on. People don't often reveal what's going on until they really, really trust you. And sometimes they don't even know what's, well, most of the time they don't even know what's going on. They have no idea why they are the way they are. For instance, in our culture, if you're using a drug, uh, a lot of people think, oh, I'm a loser, I'm a drug user. I, I, I tried to just say no, like they said in the 80s, it didn't work, I kept smoking, you know, whatever. They, they feel like they're a terrible person because our culture judges that, right? And, and we don't give much empathy when somebody's using a drug or alcohol. We don't, it's really hard to, right? Because we also have to have boundaries, which is a whole nother lecture. But there's that shame factor, right? And a lot of people think, I'm a broken person. Um, I'll never be good. I'll never be able to have a good relationship. That's a negative narrative, but we have to be able to educate them. This may have happened because of your trauma. You're actually perfectly, your body wants to heal. If, has anyone ever got a cut on their hand? You have, okay. Did it bleed forever? So you don't have that disease where you can't clot. So if you can't, if you can clot, your body wants to naturally heal that cut, okay? Our bodies wanna naturally heal from, heal from trauma. So that's where therapy comes in. But sometimes here's the issue with there. Here's the problem with healing from trauma. If you believe that you deserve to have a cut for the rest of your life over there, then you might just keep cutting yourself. You might just keep cutting your ankle every day because you deserve, you think I'm a person with a cut. Cuts don't heal. My childhood doesn't heal. But, and that gets in the way of healing. The truth is if we educate people about the trauma, it's not, it's, it's easier for them to accept, I think, than, oh, you can do it. You can get over your depression. You can get over your anxiety. No, it's like, here's how this anxiety and depression got wired into you. And now we'll use therapeutic techniques to help you get out of it. Because, but you have to understand where it came from. I had a client that came to me who literally had been obsessively breathing weirdly for 20 years and was almost going crazy and was almost hospitalized multiple times because he once took a medication, he didn't know this was the story, but once he took a medication, it was wrong, it was the wrong medication, he woke in the middle of the night, unable to breathe, freaking out, calling 911, finally he was able to breathe, he almost died. So his thought was, and his traumatic response was, I need to control my breathing at all times. So he would seriously fixate on breathing. Am I breathing? He'd think that all day long, to the point where it was impacting his marriage, his, his parenting, his work ability, he couldn't even concentrate, that all, that, and it, he got diagnosed with OCD, obsessive compulsive. Yeah, he did. That's the, that's the, that's the uh, grass, not the roots. And um, eventually I worked with him and I did a lot of EMDR therapy and also talk therapy. And what we figured out was the whole premise of him having to control his breathing came from a faulty prescription. It wasn't his breathing that was the problem. That's what his brain told him. It's your breathing, you have to control it. It was the fact that he was given a wrong prescription by accident from a doctor and that caused him to have a weird breathing episode in the middle of the night, which caused him to have to get rushed to the ER. Once we worked and worked and worked on that through EMDR and some other therapies that are by, um, mind-body therapies, and also using some basic um, you know, CBT skills, and we kept working and reinforcing, why did the breathing start that way? Why did it? He started going, oh, it's a false pretense. So he can use all sorts of coping skills every time his breathing obsession comes back, when he's stressed, it's when it comes back, and go, you know what? My body breathes automatically. I know this. It, it has nothing to do uh, with not being able to breathe. It was because I was given the wrong prescription. And that was the root of his trauma, was the wrong prescription. But he thought the root of his trauma was he couldn't breathe, if that makes sense, because it was a traumatic installation. So I'm going to try to speed through some of this because I got about 12 minutes left since we started outside. So we have to work on pulling out the roots. Um, and we don't fully have the information of what the implications of all this research are. We are we're still in the baby, we're still in the, um, the infancy of this research being integrated with therapy. We're still in the infancy of it. Um, so I won't go totally into this, but this is a little bit of the history. A lot of our therapy techniques were based on the fact that we didn't have the technology at the time to understand this. And so some of them were accidentally ego-based. Thanks, Freud. Um, some of them had a power dynamic, like. The patient is ill and the clinician is healthy, right? Some of them, and a lot of them from the 50s and up, focused on the prefrontal cortex, which is the logic center. So the logic center is the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy. 
And with repetition, repetition, and long, long times, it can work, and it does work. But the problem is when you have somebody who's coming in with acute trauma or long-standing chronic trauma, we've seen from research that the prefrontal cortex is essentially offline, which means they're only thinking, they're not thinking up here with the logic. They can't do logic. They are thinking back here, which is your memory and your language and your smell senses and your amygdala, right, where the fight, flight, freeze responses. And or they're thinking down here from the brainstem. And the brainstem is what tries to keep you safe at all times. If I see a bear, it's going to make me run probably, which is bad, but you should play dead. But point being is my brainstem doesn't know that, so it's just going to probably make me run. Um, so these people that we're getting in that have trauma, they can't think logically like we can. We're all doing our mindfulness exercises. We're all chilling out, having our nice chamomile tea in our therapy offices with our nice lighting okay we're probably in a good state of our nervous system if you've been in this profession our clients are not their nervous systems if they have trauma and their prefrontal cortex is rendered quote unquote offline it's not completely offline but it's offline enough we have to understand that a lot of it a lot of the therapy had uh, relics of cultural prejudice and religious dogma and they had assumptions uh, one of the assumptions is your brain is a malfunctioning computer. That can lead into the narrative of I'm a malfunctioning person. Why is my brain malfunctioning? Maybe I should just take drugs. Because on the, on the, on the commercial, which is correct, they lack serotonin. Why they lack serotonin? Whole other topic. But yeah, maybe I'm just a broken person. Maybe I just need medications. So we have to work on understanding that nobody's broken. They all have an innate healing complex that wants to come out. We just don't know how to do it. And a lot of people's trauma keeps them defensive because they don't want to be re-traumatized and they don't want us to help them. They, some of the integrations can't happen. You'll get to that later. We also don't want them to think that they just need to be fixed. We want to be able to get that resilience going. So um, I'm not going to go totally into this, but for instance, right now, our education systems are not trauma-informed and you can see this everywhere. Punishment is still a thing. Um, criminal justice system, uh, it doesn't work. I mean, keeping people in jail for a long time to keep us safe, I guess, works, but it doesn't rehabilitate anyone. Um, punishment doesn't work for drug users. It just reinforces the narrative that I'm a criminal, okay? We don't have rehabil many rehabilitations. Um, now, we do need boundaries because some people are a threat to society, obviously. Uh, in Phoenix, they had a, a program called Drug Court, and it worked great, but it wasn't that popular because it cost more money, which was they would let people out Monday through Friday to go to their jobs, and until they had multiple weeks of testing positive, they had to go check into jail from 5 p.m. on Friday to 6 a.m. on Monday because that was the prime time people used drugs and alcohol. And then they were able to get over their addiction with therapy and other programs. And every Friday, they have to be accountable to the judge, who is like a father or a mother to them, right? And, and it worked because it was science-based, right? But most of our criminal justice is lock them up. They're terrible. They're bad. We're labeling them this way. And then they believe that. And then when they come out, they reoffend because I am bad. I have no job. I can only work at the car wash because I'm a felon. Okay. It's not trauma informed. Uh, the worst part is now we're actually making money off people in prisons. If you don't know about that, check out the for profit prisons. So that actually incentivizes us to keep people locked up and l believe that these people are evil when actually only a very small fraction of them are sociopaths or psychopaths. Sociopaths. And psychopathic people are very hard to rehabilitate, and uh, the research on that is very minimal. But most of the people in jail are not that, okay? Um, we have to be careful about our religious institutions. Some, some religious institutions are trauma-informed, and they use um, forgiveness or grace space or whatever you want to call that in our English language, uh, Western culture, while some of them actually work on reinforcing uh, fear, guilt, and shame narratives. Oftentimes, we'll have clients that come to us that have had something bad happen to them and their church leader or synagogue leader will basically blame them for it and tell them that they're not good enough and they need to pray more and they're, and they're, and they're not going to be good enough. So we got to be careful about that. Tons of, uh, in the news media, my gosh, the news media is rampant with this stuff, uh, labeling people, um, putting people in categories. Now as humans, we want to put people in categories to make our world make sense, but some of our categories are very damaging and not humanistic in any way. So, we have to be careful about us when we're frustrated with clients that we call them resistant, right? Really what might be happening is they may be avoidant and defensive because they've been traumatized and they don't trust us and they don't want to, you know, they've got a, a complex going on. So um, sometimes <laughs> we give our opinions. We, we can't, 
don't you see how drinking is hurting you? You know, what the heck is wrong with you? I mean, not that that is a thing, but sometimes therapists get, we get frustrated. So we gotta be careful to remember that it doesn't work. Uh, we don't wanna do this. These are interventions that do not work for uh, people that are in the middle of trauma, okay? If people have recovered from trauma, CBT can work because their prefrontal cortex can, can do the, the logic stuff. But advice giving does not work. Behavioral modification doesn't work. Confrontation doesn't work. Exposure doesn't work. Psychoeducation does not work. Punishment doesn't work. Or, and this is for anyone doing trauma-specific therapy, moving too quickly through trauma-specific therapies like EMDR or somatic experience therapy without making sure that the person's able to process will also not work, okay? So that's with people that are in acute trauma or just past having trauma or have a chronic childhood of trauma. It doesn't work as well. Uh, Trauma-informed is that we are trying to look at the ecological and cultural lenses that have contributed to the trauma so we can fully understand the person holistically. I'm not gonna read everything on here. So we have to remember it all starts on adaptation. So essentially, um, I'm gonna go four or five minutes over just because I started late. The biological and behavioral foundations of trauma-informed care is that we're all trying to adapt to our environment. Everything we're doing is a, is a way on the baseline to be able to survive in what we, what we understand to be happening in our world and in our family in our, and in our body. And, and, this, and the results of that on the negative side, um, which keep us alive, are fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and collapse. So some people, when confronted with the bear, will pull out a gun. Some people, when confronted with the bear, will run. Some people, when confronted with the bear, will freeze because they're shocked. Some people, well, actually, the, the fawn doesn't really work with the bear. That would be like in a cartoon where you'd be like, let's make friends with the bear, okay? Because that's like acquiescing to the bear and basically trying to make the bear your friend. And maybe, oh, I know, fawning, maybe throwing it a stake, okay? We're kind of pleasing it. Or collapse, which is complete and utter catatonic behavior, okay? Um, this happens with our friendships. This happens with our relationships. This happens with our doctor here in the doctor's office. It's happening beneath the service. Uh, beneath the surface in your unconscious all the time. So um, a lot of times what we've realized from uh, trauma research is that people will react physically before they even know what happened mentally. And then we're talking microseconds, then they'll make up a story about why they did what they did. If you've ever been in a situation where you reacted so quickly, you ran, you fought, you yelled at somebody, um, you, somebody said something completely racist and you were like, okay, and that you didn't know what to say, right? And you, you know, in these situations, oftentimes later we'll make up a story about why we did it because we just reacted, right? Our nervous system is faster than our ability to make up a story about what's happening. That's because language is relatively recent in, in terms of evolution. That's a theory. So, um, essentially, uh, this leads to, again, when we see people's behavior, we want to just judge it, right? But there's so much more going on beneath the surface. Um, I'm not going to go completely into this, but it, the reason we have fight, flight, freeze, fawn, collapse, and avoidance or, and all of that is because of our autonomic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system regulates so many things in your body, breathing and blinking. How many of you have thought during this presentation, I should really blink? I'm gonna make sure I blink. No, you blinked like hundreds of times. It's all happening unconsciously. Most of what's happening to us is happening unconsciously. How many of you said to your kidneys, hey kidneys, can you please filter the coffee and water I drank and get the nutrients out and make sure no toxins enter my bloodstream and then make sure you deliver that to the bladder because later on, I'm gonna to have to use that bladder and empty my bladder. No, it's all happening underneath, just like all of our reactions to trauma. So, um, all right, trying to, there's so much more about the science, but if you're interested, here's a cool graphic I found, but I'm not gonna go through this because this isn't science class. Um, I'm gonna stop at about 9.34. So basically, one of the things we've learned about trauma is that a lot of times traumatic events get stored in the body and they get stored in the nervous system. The research is still kind of coming in, but we think that animals have somewhat adapted to trauma better than we have because 
if you've ever had a dog that gets scared, it immediately shakes, shakes off the physical energy and then it tries to reorient and go do something else. Humans in our culture, most of us don't really shake um, even on the dance floor. We're too ashamed to go shake on the dance floor. So imagine if you're traumatized, you're not just gonna shake it off. It, our brains are way too complex for that, right? So we store that in our memory and our memories are very, very unfortunately accurate and long standing, right? And like where, where a dog has a long memory, but it may not have the exact way of storing that we do. So we're holding it in. And when something happens uh, in our life that represents a trauma, yeah, when, when something happens, essentially a trigger can happen and that trauma can reappear as a reaction. Then we blame ourselves or blame the environment because we have to make up a story about why we responded the way we did. Almost done. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all the science anymore, but anyway, essentially tr we'll get into triggers. Triggers are things that represent things that happened in the past, two people that have trauma, and essentially what happens is they re-experience it and then they feel shame or guilt or whatever, or they feel like they're broken. Whoa, that's pretty cool. Um, again, I think I went over this. I, will, I won't go through the whole brainstem, but anyway, all these things can happen when you have trauma. All these things obviously look like things in the uh, DSM. So I think I made a three hour presentation. So if you want this PDF, uh, you, I'll, I will email it to you. So the last thing I wanna get to before I, um, before I close is one little exercise. So I'm gonna go to the exercise, sorry, here we go. Because some of you took the ACE quiz and I apparently did not time myself very well. So <laughs> I'm just gonna go through this. Um, I think I covered a lot of this in my talking, just so you know, you're not like getting, um, you're not really missing much. I just am very wordy. So here we go. So this is something that I think is important for the rest of the day, because a lot of the rest of the day is based on the research here. And we're gonna do a lot of exercises and a lot of application for your clients, which is pretty cool. So there's this quote I like that says, in general, you can only lead people on the journey as far as you've gone. Transformed people, transform people, transform people. When you can be healed yourself and not just talk about healing, you are, as Henry Norwin said, a wounded healer. That's Richard Rohr, who's this, he's a philosophical writer. And um, essentially, I guess what I'm asking you is some of you, oops, some of you, this is like a reminder of stuff you already know, and I elaborated way too much right? And for some of you, this may be disoriented because this was not included in your graduate school or gra undergraduate training because it honestly, the research was not there. Literally, this is the last 20 years. So I want everyone to do this little exercise. If this was disturbing to you, if it wasn't disturbing to you, you're like, cool, can't wait for the rest of presentations where he's not just talking the whole time in their school videos and activities. But if, if, if that's not you, did you have a fight in your body? Did you want to argue with me and say, this sounds crazy. I think this guy's nuts. He has too much coffee. I'm going to pull out my textbook from, you know, whenever I went to school and I'll show him. Flight. Um, I wonder if I can get my other computer from the other room to watch Netflix and mute this so I can get my continuing ed while watching um, a marathon of Schitt's Creek. Right. Or I'm going to run away like that person did. Just kidding. No one ran. Um, freeze. I feel like he just took a fire hose and stuck it in my face and turned the water on blast. I don't know what to do. I now I'm questioning everything I've ever done. Fawn, uh, which is pretend to acquiesce to the information, but you have no intentions of get, gathering further education. So maybe you were like, yeah, that sounds great. One's five o'clock, you know, uh, or on the verge of collapse, basically you feel that what you were giving as treatment wasn't useful and you feel maybe like upset about that. So here's the thing. Don't give up. If this isn't stuff you already know, you can take the stuff you learn from this presentation and the rest of the day and any other stuff you learn and really integrate it into what you're already doing. It's not that difficult. It's just difficult when you first understand it to see what the implications are. When I first heard this, I was so angry. I was in a, I was a fighter. I was like, I was, I wrote to my grad school actually. I was like, how come this wasn't a class? This is ridiculous. 
I feel like you wasted my money. This was, I mean, I heard this information in 2009, but I graduated in 2007, and I was like, this is insulting. They're like, oh, we're working on getting trauma-informed care to be part of the curriculum. I'm like, it should be part of every class. It should be part of every class because if we don't understand how the body and mind work, how am I supposed to know how my therapeutic interventions are working? So that was me. But if, if maybe this is old news to you, don't worry. If it's new news to you, don't worry. It's going to be fine. We can integrate and learn, and it'll just make your practice a lot easier. And that's the benefit. If you know trauma-informed care, therapy gets a lot easier. Not kidding. So here's my references. Let's go one by one and read them. Just kidding. Okay, now we're on a 15-minute break. Um, I have a podcast. If you like listening to people talk for a long time, but I have really cool guests that make it actually interesting. I interview a lot of psychologists and therapists and philosophers. And if you want to know about uh, how to get trauma-specific training, this is our website. This is the clinic um, that we work at. And um, we'll leave you with that. And we'll do a 